going to talk cost sponsorship. Obviously, uh, for those who know me, this is where I make my, my living. This is where I spend all of my time steeped in the cause sponsorship space. Uh, and I also happen to very biasly believe that this is the best and coolest of all of the corporate partnerships. But all 15 of the speakers that you're going to hear from today feel the same way about their particular area. So that's me. I used to tell people that this is me before I lost 40 pounds. Then I gained it all back. So this is just me. And I had to go clothes shopping last week, which I hate, so I guess I have to lose weight again. I run a company called The Sponsorship Collective. We do one thing. We answer the question, what are my sponsorship opportunities worth? We're a valuation firm. We do it for brands, we do it for causes. I am based in Ottawa. Any Ottawans in the room? Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Ottawa is the coldest capital in the world, the worst winter in Canada, and unofficially, the most boring city in Canada, I might say, as well. And, and so concludes my talk for today. So we're based in Ottawa. Uh, we're also incorporated in the United States. So this little Ottawa shop of one has grown and expanded and has now taken on North America. So we are a valuation firm. And today I'm going to talk to you about the process of cause sponsorship. I'm going to dispel, dispel a myth right now. Sponsorship is not about putting logos on stuff. You can do that if you want, but that's not sponsorship. So that's not really what I'm going to be talking about today. But I'm going to talk to you about the process of sponsorship that I learned through the School of Hard Knocks. Got to press this really hard, my, my fellow speakers. Through the story of Travis and Chris. Travis was my boss when I first started in the charitable sector. His name is actually Trevor but he was misquoted by the media as Travis Dallaire, which isn't even close to his name, and so it stuck. So I've called him Travis ever since. I moved from the brand side into the charitable sector, and I started doing what every good corporate fundraiser does, firing unsolicited sponsorship packages out the door with reckless abandon. <laughs> Only back then, we had the internet, but we put things in the mail and we sent them to people. So I had stacks of annual reports and stacks of sponsorship pitch decks in my office, and I would send them out. Six months went by. Guess how successful it was? You already know. Not at all. And then one day my phone rang. I'd never heard it ring before. <laughs> Hello. Chris, this is Dave. I'm from Company X. I'd like you to come in and pitch to us. I'd like you to come and tell us how we could work together. Dave, that's wonderful news. Sign me up. I'll be there on Tuesday at 3 o'clock. But before I, before I show up, can you tell me, was it gold, silver, or bronze that caught your eye? <laughs> he wasn't kind enough to laugh. Instead, he told me that they hadn't read a sponsorship package in 10 years. And this was more than 10 years ago. In fact, they got over 10,000 unsolicited sponsorship packages every single month that they promptly threw in the garbage. Now they would just delete it or filter it through their online forms. He said the words that changed my career forever. The reason you're here is because we did the market research. You appeal most strongly, while you and two of your competitors appeal strongly, among 40-year-old high net worth moms who live in the suburbs, who prefer luxury brands, have two or more children, and those children play hockey. That's our target market. That's who we want to delight. And that's why we've invited you to pitch. I, well, I recycled all of my sponsorship packages and radically changed how I did cause sponsorship as a practitioner and as a consultant. So Travis and I did pitch. And whether or not we won the day, you're going to have to wait 21 and a half minutes to find out. So I want you to think of the corporate partnership spectrum as exactly that. This is not to scale. So all of my fellow presenters who think me jamming everything in the center uh, was incorrect, you're probably right. But I want to really drive home the point that sponsorship sits in the transactional marketing sales space in terms of measuring outcomes. And corporate philanthropy, if there is such a thing, I will leave that to my corporate partners in the room to talk about, is measured over here on the social impact side. The good you do, perhaps. 
And then everything in the middle is sort of sprinkled. So again, not to scale, but it does drive home the point that sponsorship sits on the marketing, transactional, sales side of the spectrum in corporate partnerships. And that's what I'm gonna be presenting to you today. And I sure hope that many of the speakers who follow me disagree with this and challenge this and challenge you to think differently. I already see the CIBC people nodding, so I think you're in for a treat. So there's three ideas that I wanna share with you today. Three that I want you to walk away with, or that I want you to completely disagree with for good reason. Cause sponsorship is a unique, standalone discipline. It must be respected as such, it must be measured as such. Yes, indeed, you can use it to amplify your other corporate partnership opportunities, but you must measure it as a marketing discipline. A number of people asked through the pre-conference survey, why are we still talking about sponsorship as a standalone discipline? Because it is. Sponsorship is highly systematic. It focuses on process and measurable outcomes. There are a number of steps that you must take to do good cause sponsorship. And idea number three, sponsorship is not philanthropy plus logo. If you are asking a company for money to do good in this world, and you're going to put the logo of their company or worse, their foundation on a sign, you're in trouble. My brand friends, if you are talking to your cause partners about making an impact and doing good in this world and asking them to submit the application through your foundation and then asking for a whole bunch of marketing benefits, you're sending confusing messages. You just happen to be sitting here at the team at CIBC, so I keep looking at you. You are not guilty of doing that. <laughs> CIBC is awesome, as you're gonna hear. They're just in an unfortunate position. I said you're in the heckling zone. So it's a marketing discipline. It must be treated as such. <laughs> Thank you for laughing. If a point is worth making, it's worth overmaking. Right? It's not philanthropy plus logos. The best sponsorship I've ever seen has no logos anywhere. What could you do together with your partners without putting a logo on anything? Sponsorship is defined by IFG and Forbes as cash paid for access to exploitable commercial potential. For what? Exploitable commercial potential. Thanks everyone for joining in. <laughs> Exploitable commercial potential. As one of the most important weapons, weapons in the $100 billion a year world of advertising, or we'd say marketing now. When you're practicing sponsorship, are you practicing it with exploitable commercial potential in mind? Or does that make you uncomfortable? This lady here says it does not make her uncomfortable. You're one in a hundred. I'm also flawless. Well, <laughs> so then you're lying. Sponsorship is a verb. It's not a thing companies buy. No one goes to the sponsorship store and buys some sponsorship units. Sponsorship describes an action, an activity. It is not a standalone thing. It lets you pull from advertising, sampling, experiential, content marketing, employee engagement to achieve a goal, to achieve an end. Sponsorship is a verb. I love showing this slide when I speak internationally. Look at Canada over here, 13.5% growth on a actually now over $2 billion a year sponsorship industry. This does not include any corporate philanthropy this stat is purely exploitable commercial potential. In North America, 22 billion a year, globally 60 billion. We are growing in Canada at three times the North American and international rate. And cause sponsorship makes up about 33, three, sorry, $330 million of that. So the sponsorship landscape study, which you should all read, it's outstanding calls cause sponsorship as distinct from arts and education. I don't agree with that. So together it's around $330 million a year. Using charities, connecting with charities to connect with a very specific audience 
the 40-year-old high net worth mom who lives in the suburbs, to access the exploitable commercial potential that they have to offer. That's what this refers to. Agencies, so organizations like mine, many others in the room, represent brands and invest in sponsorship. The brands that they work with then in turn invest even more money to activate or leverage their sponsorship. The average, obviously these are big orgs, $828,000 spent by the organization to tell the world that they've engaged in this sponsorship opportunity. This is what they're spending the money on. This probably isn't a good time to tell everybody the hashtag for the conference is hashtag corporate partnerships. So use it. Feel free to take pictures. I don't know if you covered that, Brian. So many other thought leaders in the sponsorship space will tell you logo placement is dead. I don't agree. It's not dead. It's just not so good. It's just not that useful. You want to test it for yourself? Next time the team at CIBC sponsor your event, throw a Q at the end of their company name and put their logo upside down. Shelly, without question, will come and tap you on the shoulder and tell you you made a mistake. But it doesn't mean it's important to them. Right? I often hear from people, sponsors are always telling me, you got to use this logo, that logo, in this way. But that doesn't actually mean it's the most important thing to them. And in fact, Logo placement sits in the advertising space, which only makes up around 13% of the total spend of companies when they're activating and leveraging their sponsorship. So brands and causes alike, if you are practicing logo placement as the starting and end point of your sponsorship, you are leaving a lot of impact on the table and a lot of cash on the table. And could be why you're not experiencing a 13% growth in your sponsorship every year. trying to look very regal as this man takes my picture. <laughs> Do I look smart? I feel smart. Sponsorship allows you to focus on a niche audience with laser-like precision in exactly the way that your audience wants to be treated, driving them towards exactly the goal that a brand wants them to take. This is sponsorship. This is the verb. Someone much smarter than me already said it. The minimum viable audience. When you seek to engage with everyone, you delight no one. The solution is simple but counterintuitive. Stake out the smallest market that you can imagine. The smallest market. The smallest market that can sustain you. The smallest market that you can adequately serve and delight them. You don't need 100,000 people at your event. Brands, your charity partners don't need 100,000 people at their, at their event. They just need the right people. Sorry for what I'm about to say. It makes perfect sense in American English, not so much in Canadian English. The riches in the niches. The riches in the niches doesn't really jive. The riches in the niches. We're going to try this again, everybody. The riches, yeah. So next time you catch yourself saying, we have to find a charity partner with 800 zillion people at their event, stop yourself and say, the rich is in the niches. The next time you catch yourself saying, we can't work with CIBC because we don't have 100,000 people at our event, step back and ask who your 40-year-old high net worth mom is and ask them who they're trying to connect with. I'll pick on Deloitte for the rest of the, my presentation. So I was representing a brand in this case. We set up an activation on top of a ski hill. You got a free lift ticket if you test drove a truck. When they test drove a truck, these individuals, they were tagged in the sponsor's database, in the brand's database. We were then able to track 23 sales directly from this event, from this activation, over the course of four hours. It took six months for them to buy, but we were able to track it. This is in the US, so $700,000 in sales, or $8.5 million Canadian. They only had 87 people do a test drive. The charity came back to us the next year and said, we want, to, we want to work together again, but we'd like to double your rights fees. To which my client said, can we sign a multi-year agreement so you don't do that again? They had a license to print money. Sponsors don't want everyone. They want the right people. 
the riches and the niches. So over the last two years, in fact, some of those, these folks are in the room today, the Sponsorship Collective has worked on around $10 million in naming rights alone, right? So the Nike walk, right, the Reebok run. Every single naming right opportunity, without exception, required the following. Several well-defined audience segments. Clearly defined goals for each individual audience. Agreed upon measures for those goals. Both sides agreed what would be measured. Both sides agreed that every quarter we would both report progress on achieving those goals. Of course, it required a third party valuation, which was great news to me, and complex and highly interactive activations. They absolutely had logos, but it was not the most important part by far. You're gonna get a copy of all the presentations, by the way, and we forgot to mention, we're recording all the sessions. So every speaker who's comfortable with it, we're going to be sharing with you a recording of every one of these sessions. And I am comfortable with it, so you're gonna get a recording of this session. Still take pictures and share it on social media, but no, no need to, to be panicked if I've gone too fast through a slide. So none of these negotiations, none of them involved stock sponsorship packages. They didn't start with a package. In fact, we didn't even use one. We didn't use one at all. No mission, vision, or impact measures. No big check ceremonies and silly pictures. Logo placement was not the main focus. Nobody wanted to get in touch with in front of the general public or everyone or middle class families. Brands, if you're not sure who you're trying to connect with, through your sponsorship endeavors, they will not be successful. No companies gave money because they had so much of it. I still hear that from time to time. Did, did cause play a role? Of course it did, but not in the way you think. Audience cares about cause. Brand cares about audience. So there is a thread, there is a connection, but it's not the one you think. So for the charities in the room, this is how every sponsorship opportunity works. And then we're gonna look at it from a brand perspective. You have an opportunity that brings in a particular audience, 40-year-old high net worth moms who live in the suburbs. Then you ask that audience, what brands do they care about? What are they hoping to purchase? What values do they hold? What triggers a buying decision? And then you use that to connect with your prospects to ask them how they wanna connect with that audience. Sponsors, brands in the room, you start at the other end. You ask yourself, who's the audience? Who's the target market that we are trying to impact? How will we measure success? What's the buying trigger for these individuals? And then brands don't automatically say sponsorship is the way. Brands say, let's look at the full marketing spectrum, the full CSR spectrum, the full corporate philanthropy, the full impact everything that we could possibly do, and can we use sponsorship to help influence a decision? And then if we can, is it sport? Is it cause? Is it education? Is it municipalities? What is it that we do? So if cause is going heavy on mission and brand is going heavy on audience, you're gonna miss each other. Sponsorship is always this. If you're not doing this but getting money, you're not practicing sponsorship. You're doing something else. Are you, are you looking for the five minute warning? No, okay, I'm safe. Because I have far more than five minutes worth of things to say. So in the absence of the following three questions, you're not practicing sponsorship. Every partnership must ask these three questions. Who is our shared audience? Question number one. It's a good chance a brand already knows who cares about your cause. You need to have this conversation. What action do we want them to take? Sponsorship is a verb, it requires an action. And then how will we measure success? That is the sponsorship conversation, cause or otherwise, but certainly cause sponsorship. So let's apply this to our favorite, as a sector, charity and brands. We are obsessed with putting out logos on stuff. And then it, equally obsessed with asking the question, why didn't we get ROI from our sponsorship? So who's our shared target audience? 
anyone who sees that logo up there, what action do we want them to take? We want to raise awareness. We want them to be aware. We want them to know that we have a logo. <laughs> How will we measure success? We'll measure awareness units, right? Falls apart. Instead, who's our shared target audience? 34-year-old tradesmen who are in the market for a truck. Gender, in this case, was important. They wanted men who are in the market for a truck, who have two children, and therefore need the, the four-door pickup, the very expensive version. What action do we want them to take? We want them to test drive a truck, because we know one in 10 test drives leads to the purchase of a vehicle. How will we measure success? Well, we're gonna follow them through our sales pipeline and see if they purchase. And if they purchase at a rate higher than one in 10, it was a successful sponsorship activation. It did better than an ad in a newspaper. Sponsorship in action. So Travis and I, we were invited to pitch. And pitch we did. But as we were about to walk out the door, I noticed that Travis had nothing in his hands. By nothing, I mean nothing. Not pitch deck. <laughs> not annual report, no PowerPoint presentation, legitimately nothing. And I, being the junior person, assumed my boss was preparing all of this information, that he was doing all the work. I said, Travis, where's your stuff? He said, I don't bring stuff to sales meetings. How could I possibly make a sale if I don't know what they want? So we showed up at the meeting. And coming out of the meeting room was a a uh, young child who was clearly very sick in a wheelchair, being pushed by what we assumed was his mother, whose mascara was running down her face because she had been crying, and the fundraisers from this other organization. They went in and pitched heavy on mission. And immediately I thought, we're toast. Trevor looks like me, maybe a little shorter and a, a little bit stockier. Not impressive enough to beat that story, I thought. So we went in, and the company asked us one question. We're going to write you a check for a million bucks. How are you going to spend it? What would you say? Would you talk about how many trees you're going to plant? How many kids you're going to help? How many hospitals you're going to build? We didn't. Travis said, I'm going to take your check, and I'm going to lock it in my desk, and I'm going to call a meeting with you. Because until I know exactly what you're trying to achieve and whether or not I can deliver, I haven't earned the right to cash the check. My job, he says, is not to make magic happen. We're going to do that. Of course we are. My job is to make sure that at the end of a year together, you beg me to work with me again. Until I know you, that I can actually deliver, it's a non-starter. Sounds pretty slick. In the meeting, it sure didn't feel very slick. I thought we were toast. So Company X said, you know, it's interesting. Nobody else has seen this. And they took out a 37-page pitch deck, a marketing deck about what they're trying to accomplish and the role they want their cause partner to play. And we went through it line by line. They told us who they were trying to connect with, what they were trying to achieve, how they would measure success, and we were honest about whether or not we could deliver. And at the end of that meeting, they did indeed slide a proverbial check across the table. But it wasn't a million bucks, it was two and a half million. And in that one move, we doubled the size of our, at the time, very small organization. We won the day. We won because both parties came together honestly to talk about what they were trying to achieve. They didn't tell us it was about the cause. We didn't tell them that, we would, that we're better than those other charities who are, who are not doing real cause work. We were honest about our capabilities otherwise known as the art of doing nothing. This experience, very early in my career, radically changed the, the practice of cause sponsorship for me and the one that I participate in to this day with, with our clients. And it works well. You can't go in hoping to make the sale. Wrap it up, OK. You can't go in hoping to make the sale. And as a brand, 
I'm asking you and encouraging you to be honest about what it is you're trying to achieve. We're all good causes. Okay, so final thoughts. Do we have time for questions, Brad? Okay, cool. Are there any questions to be answered? Okay, thank God. All right, so final thoughts. <laughs> that's, that's the mark of a good presentation where no one asks a single question. So my hope today is that you're going to hear conflicting information. I hope CIBC is going to get up and say a bunch of stuff that actually doesn't jive with anything I've said. I hope. But I'll be flattered if they completely agree with me. I hope that you're going to hear from others who are going to tell you things that conflict with what I've said. Because the only thing that you can walk away from this experience today, both sides, is that every meeting has to start from square one, from, from ground zero. You have to start with pure discovery. You have to start from a place of openness. We call it discovery in the sponsorship space, but it requires that we, as members of the corporate partnership space, discipline, profession, have enough respect for each other that we have these open and honest conversations. So you guys have been very patient, very kind. You almost participated every time I asked you to. So I thank you. We're gonna take a couple of questions. If you haven't entered a question and you'd like to, or you wanna upvote a question, use this link uh, to do so. Brad, are, you gonna, are we gonna throw questions up there or are you gonna ask them? Oh my goodness. So there is actually a screen down here. I'm not obsessed with Phil Hayde's feet. What is the most effective way to learn about your event audience to share with sponsors? All right. This is an excellent question. Where are my friends from Enveronics? There's Alan. Stand up, Alan. Oh, who else? Stand up. See these people? Hunt them down at coffee break and attack them. They give out tons of awesome free advice. They're going to talk to you about audience data. To get qualitative data, so quantitative data is essential, right? You have to know all of the stuff about who your, your audience is. But I think you also need a qualitative component. You have to know what they thought of your event, what they hated about your event. And guess what? You're all going to get a survey from us asking you to tell us what you hated about this day. You tell us what you hated, we're going to fix it. And then we're going to go find a sponsor who cares about connecting with you to fix it for you. Right? That's the, that is how you make sponsorship activations work. So a survey is a very simple, very easy tool to deliver to extract information. I believe you have to go very, very deep, 30 data points or more, to have a robust sponsorship program. And so uh, folks like Enveronics, you asked this question. I did not plant this. I, I happen to love the people at Enveronics. Um, they're able to get pretty deep into what people want, what they think, psychographic information, all that stuff. But I, I still believe you need to round it out with a survey to get some more information about activations. So it sounds simple, survey plus some, some data analysis of your database. That's really enough to build the foundation of your sponsorship program. Uh, check out my website. I've got a couple of posts written specifically about extracting audience data in, in my blog as well. Other questions? Brett? There are. Mm. The answer to this question is highly technical. He says sarcastically. How do you know if a corporation is looking for sponsorship opportunities or philanthropy? The messaging is mixed a lot of the times. I agree with you. The messaging is mixed. If you're extracting the, sorry brands, uh, uh, you may not want me to give this advice that I'm going to. If you're extracting the majority of your advice, your information from a website, you're probably going to get conflicting information. I don't know if the website is designed for the fundraiser in mind to tell them specifically how to get money from them. I'm not saying it isn't, I just don't know. So the way that I've always approached sponsorship versus corporate philanthropy versus employee engagement versus whichever. When I'm in the meeting, first of all, I think about who I'm talking to. If Shelly from the cause sponsorship space is sitting across from me, we're talking sponsorship and probably impact too. If I'm talking to the head of HR, I better have some good employee engagement opportunities ready to go, or at least some good questions to ask about employee engagement. But all this to say, sp sponsorship and sales in general doesn't start with the proposal, it ends with the proposal. 
the sponsorship process starts with a conversation. And so I ask the question always, always, who's your target market? Who's your target audience? If they can't answer that or don't know, we're probably not going to talk sponsorship. What, what, is it, what did you have in mind for our meeting today so that I can, I can provide the right information for you when we finally meet? Those kind of things will extract the information you need. So the way to get this information, I don't think is from the website before you have a meeting so you can have a highly tailored pitch. If you ask Travis, what does this company want? Who have they given to in the last couple of years? He would tell you he had no idea. I'm not necessarily recommending that as a strategy. But really, this information comes from your prospect. Making an assumption will kill the deal, in my view. Now, I think a version of this question is actually going to be asked of the CIBC team. And so I'd be interested to see what they think. Other questions? Is that it? Were you kicking me off? Oh, my goodness. Uh, how did you get so many great sponsors for this conference? What was their motive? You picked that question? Really? So I'll tell you, um, I'll share a story. Where's Andrea Donlin? There she is. So Andrea, manifest. My second call after calling Brad to say, we, we got to run this conference, was to Andrea. And I said to Andrea, you were, you're part of Companies and Causes Canada. We got, we got to have something. Tell me everything that stunk about that event, and let's fix it together. And then I said, what is it you're trying to achieve by being here? What is it that you're trying to accomplish? Like, what do you want people to walk away? What is the right mix of people in the audience? Andrea told us. So we did it. That's how we got these sponsors, by asking them what they were trying to achieve and delivering, and being really transparent and open about whether or not we could deliver. Now, why did I think Andrea and Phil and Shelley would have an interest in this space? Because they do business actively in this space. So there was absolutely no, we're going to go put Phil in a headlock and force Public Inc. to give us cash for this conference. Not that at all. We talked about what we're trying to achieve as colleagues and professionals in this space. And if we couldn't deliver, there are plenty of sponsors not here today that we gave it our college try and certainly weren't interested in working with us because we couldn't accomplish what they were trying to accomplish. There's no trickery. There's no sales. It's really just about doing good discovery, and either you can deliver or you can't. Brad standing here, hulking over me, which means that my time has come to an end. So thank you so much, everyone. Enjoy the rest of the show. I'll see you at lunchtime.